Yeah, I know you, you've um, written and talked about the influence of um, reading the lives and, and biographies of historical figures on your own um, kind of character and ambitions. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how you came across these lives of people like, you know, the lives of Alexander and so on? I guess I began reading about them when I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had a, a horse who I called after Alexander the Great's horse when I was six. So I, I must have been reading this stuff when almost before I can remember. And was that, um, your, did your father encourage you in kind of classical studies? And yeah, my, my father um, used to, uh, yeah, I mean, he tried to teach me Greek when I was four or five. Um, and um, he spent a lot of time laying out ancient battlefields on the nursery floor with plastic soldiers. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I guess um, something from, from when I was very young. I was always very interested in how old people did things at. I remember I was always flipping back to the beginning of books and mm -hmm. um, to remind myself when exactly they were born. Um, and if I discovered that you know, John Stuart Mill at the age of 11 had written two books and I was 11, I'd be very worried about that situation. Um, so I think it was a sort of competitiveness, but it was a competitiveness with people who were dead. Mm. Because you've written about Alexander that he was haunted by the competition of dead men. Was that true yourself as well? I think probably less so than him. <laughs> I mean, I think the... Uh, f for me, I mean, a couple of things. One of them, of course, is that you can't quite continue that in the modern world, that sort of way of thinking. Mm. Um, it's too ridiculous. And I was very struck by this because I've been looking at Enoch Powell and Michael Foote recently, who tried to live as sort of grand classical figures and took themselves deeply seriously and saw politics as this grand vocation. And unfortunately, they end up looking ludicrous in the modern world. I mean, it's, it, the modern world doesn't give you the space to take yourself seriously in that kind of way. Mm. Um, so, firstly, toned down by the modern world. Secondly, I think by my walk across Afghanistan where I realised that um, at the end of it uh, I didn't feel I had so much to prove anymore. Is it true that in your 20s you were thinking, or you started to write a book on heroes and you were thinking a lot about this idea, what, what were some of your thoughts on it? What, what were you thinking about it? What so did you my, want to say idea, in that My idea book? on the classical heroes, the classical heroes obsessed with previous heroes. Mm -hmm. So Alexander wants to be Achilles. He runs around the walls of Troy. He has Achilles, great phrase, ever to be the best and stand above all others, put above his tent, has the Iliad under his pillow. Mm -hmm. uh, Caesar desperately wants to be Alexander and famously weeps when he realizes what Alexander's achieved in mm -hmm. his age. Mm -hmm. Napoleon wants to be Caesar, mm -hmm. you know, dresses like Caesar. Byron collects Napoleon's carriage and locks mm. of his hair. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Lawrence Arabia, mm -hmm. you know, he also travels with the Iliad and the Mort D'Arthur and he reads mm -hmm. about nice shining So I think the important thing to understand is that a certain model of classical heroism mm -hmm. is predicated on people who want to be heroes, which is something mm -hmm. which is very uncomfortable in the modern age because mm -hmm. today we like to feel that heroes should be accidental heroes or heroes as victims, rather than people who consciously set out to create a heroic narrative. Mm. Do you think that, I mean obviously you're still quite attracted to that model, even if you see that it's a bit um, anachronistic, it, it's still something that, that's formed your um, personality. Um, I mean you, you, you seem to still ha use these figures as role models, like T. E. Lawrence for example. Yes, I mean, I think it's, it is useful to be able to um, challenge yourself with other people's lives and other people's decisions. It is true that humans learn enormously through imitation and emulation. Mm. Um, and you notice in most 
medieval tapestries mm -hmm. in the stained glass the city of London school or in busts in people's rooms or in Montaigne's study images of past people yeah the lives um, of the saints yeah, and so on yeah all their quotes or, mm -hmm. um, and you know endless medieval tapestries with pictures of Alexander and Caesar or mm -hmm. the heroes in the mm -hmm. Um if you go to the Uffizi the entire gallery is strung with these Mm. great heroes, both on the ceilings and on the walls, so that if you were a Medici you could look up and remind yourself the great heroes of generosity, the great heroes of literature, the great heroes of... Mm. The, the key point about Romans taking very seriously the fact that a particular general allows himself to be burnt by the barbarians without doing anything other than saying, you know, see how a Roman dies or executes his own son for breaking the front line of the battle mm. uh, are not very useful in a society which isn't a martial society. Mm. Um, so do you think that the figure of the great person is kind of, it doesn't have any place in, in, the, in a modern multilateral geopolitical landscape? Um, I think a great person of a classical sort requires an audience who's prepared to think they're great. Um, in the absence of that, you're simply absurd. I mean, all of these guys tread a very, very narrow line between greatness and absurdity. And Shakespeare makes endless jokes out of this. That the classical hero is, by his very nature, somebody who's a bit of a fantasist, a bit boastful, a bit liable to blow themselves up, to have a somewhat exaggerated opinion of their own. Mm. They are trying to be godlike and believe mm. maybe they do have some magical powers. Um, and whether that is consigned as, you know, kind of megalomania, paranoia, delusion, in other words, categorized as a kind of medical disease, or whether it's categorized as ludicrous, empty, vain, self-promoting nonsense, mm. or whether a society responds to it sensitively and sees that out of those slightly odd attitudes something rather worthwhile emerges. I mean, if you take Lawrence, for example, clearly uh, you can, from the perspective of a modern man, look at him and say he was a fantasist, uh, he had very, very strange sexuality, he paid people to beat him, he um, uh, claimed to have done desert journeys more quickly than he actually did, he uh, made promises he didn't keep, he pushed himself into areas that he wasn't qualified to talk about. Um, but he still lives in a time when the majority of his contemporaries could still see the point of him. Uh, whether it's Arabs with him saying, of men the man, I can see no flaw in him, or mm. whether it's Churchill saying, we shall not see his like again. Um, but of course, that's because the Arab with him or Churchill themselves occupy a world of heroism and grand dignity and grand mm. achievement. So it's very easy for Churchill to feel, dealing with Lawrence, that he's sort of resonating with another mm. great soul. Mm. Um, but by the time you reach a society in which those things aren't valued, mm. such societies have existed in other cultures around the world. I mean, mm. take ancient China, for example, mm. or Heian Dynasty Japan, they have no room for mm. military heroes. Uh, Seishinagan, in her pillow book in the 8th mm -hmm. century, describes seeing one of the great Japanese heroes come in with his great beard mm -hmm. from the war. And she's totally dismissive of him. I mean, he's of no interest whatsoever. She prefers these rather etiolated court men with their plucked eyebrows who compose sonnets by the, mm -hmm. by the carp pond. Um, so it's... So something remains. I mean, if you look at Gladiator, for example, the entire structure of the movie is predicated on the fact that contemporary American men, particularly, mm. love hearing somebody say, what we do in this life echoes in eternity, or love hearing him say, I'm 
uh, one of the other guys says, uh, why don't they know they're defeated? He says, would you ever know you're defeated? Would I? <laughs> um, uh, so that, that remains, right? I mean, mm. uh, but it's a very simplified form. Mm. And it largely has been pushed out of everyday life into mm. the big screen, the huge stakes. Um, and so it, it, the guys who still take it seriously, in my experience, are soldiers. You know, American military, American police mm. yeah. talk all the time about honor, dignity, loyalty, mm. sacrifice. Yeah. Um, and do you think that's why um, places where civilization has been disrupted um, or is still at quite maybe a, a less advanced state sometimes attract people from the West, young people who still want to do something kind of grand and dashing? Oh, for, for sure. I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that um, from the late 18th century onwards, uh, British India and the North West Frontier, for example, becomes a place in which you can get away from the Industrial Revolution. And, and act out Plutarch. And yeah, and there's no accident mm. that, you know, the reason why Alexander Burns wears native clothes, rides around on a white horse, or mm. Lawrence wears flowing narrow rows, around, and they sit in tents, and they... Mm. is that they are they are able to be knights in shining armor. I mean, they, they are riding on their white horse with their scimitar across the... Whereas the reality is, the whole of England behind them is being turned into an industrial smog. Mm. Um, and they come back to Britain and, of course, find it very, very difficult to adjust again. Mm. Because um, that they become slightly sort of... They're figures who the Victorians are able to write biographies of and make paintings of and get excited about. Mm. But but they're always treated with a certain amount of distrust and contempt by the establishment when they return home. Mm, mm. Um, but how about, how have you found it uh, since you've kind of come back from Iraq and Afghanistan? changes in my life is that, and that's almost a sort of accident, is I went off to set up um, an art school in Kabul, and I felt at the time uh, I'm not the sort of person who sets up an art school that doesn't seem like a kind of grand narrative. Um, and then I realised, and I was there for just over three years, that it was probably the most satisfying thing I'd ever done, on a tiny little scale, mm. um, working in two or three city blocks, very small. Mm. And that it was actually far more satisfying than when I'd been, theoretically, you know, the coalition deputy governor mm -hmm. of an Iraqi province with two and a half million people in the Maranesseria and eye-watering budgets and incredible power and military units and armoured vehicles and, um, where I achieved nothing um, and where I felt that that sort of power is very empty because you don't actually do anything really. You know, you sort of issue commands but you're so detached from what's actually happening that often nothing's happening and that even if it is happening it's not really happening because of you. Whereas somehow setting up a small art school in Kabul I did sort of feel I was on the ground and I could have a look at the building and I could affect what was happening mm. and I could see that the rubbish was being cleared and the water mm. supply was going in and, the, and that I developed relationships with individuals. And, um, mm. I think it's... It... It's a question of scale. Yeah. And I, I think the... And in a sense, I suppose I'm very lucky... No, which is that I feel 
people often say to me, isn't it very boring being in Cumbria? You know, you're dealing with drains or you're dealing with whatever. Um, the reality is that it's deeply satisfying, probably for some of the same reasons that I found running a charity satisfying, which is to say that it's very, very consistently concrete. Mm. And very diverse. So, you know, I will go into a school and I'll walk around and I'll try to make sure at the end of my visit I've got a couple of things to follow up on or I've spotted something and mm. then I'll be in rather a complicated question about what happens in the hospital. Then we'll be uh, talking to farmers about dairy contracts. Then we'll be trying to, I mean, and all the time you're trying to mm. solve these different kinds of problems. So I suppose it, for me the the liberation has been leaving these kinds of ideas of heroism behind and, and mm. learning to approach them a little bit more ironically has probably been quite mm. quite useful for me. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's, I think it's also a question of age. I, d I don't know whether this is true, but my guess is that it's not an accident that Alexander dies at 33, that Shelley and Byron are dead in their mid-30s, that, mm. that that sort of incredible sort of romantic self-conception self, it's a sort of delayed adolescence. Mm. It, um, and it can't be maintained indefinitely in the face of the reality of the world, because the reality mm. of the world is that is that in the end the basic Christian complaint about this which Gibbon would argue destroyed the Roman Empire, was to say that this idea of heroism is a form of pride and a form of vanity because fame is worthless when you're dead. That this idea that you know, Maximus is selling that what we do in this life echoes in eternity or Nietzsche's idea of eternal recurrence mm. um, are myths, encouraging, satisfying, cheerful myths, mm. but ultimately without foundation. Uh, that you die and nobody remembers who you are and mm. your tomb of brass gradually rusts. And, mm. and what's left of Alexander today, a string of anecdotes, but we have no idea really whether he looked like you or looked mm. like me or whether he was funny or whether mm. he was kind or how he moved or anything, really. Mm. There's nothing left of the man, mm. except a series of grandiloquent actions. Mm.